Hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Murphy, and today I'm taking you through a short webinar about how to navigate the world with hearing loss. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which I live, work, and play, which is uh, Gundangara country, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'm calling in from Sydney, Australia. I'm a freelance writer and my work about disability, deafness and arts criticism has been widely published in Australia and overseas. I've had pieces in The Guardian, The Age, Sydney Morning Herald, uh, The Welcome Collection, amongst many other titles. And here are just some of the books that my work um, has also appeared in. In 2021, my memoir about hearing loss was published in Australia and New Zealand, and then it was published in North America and the UK in 2022. And this book is really about my experience of hiding my deafness and keeping it a secret, which I kept a secret for over 20 years. So a lot of this webinar is not um, just all the wonderful things about navigating the world with hearing loss, but hopefully it's a relatable conversation about the difficulties of navigating the world and some tips and tricks I've learned along the way and how I developed my confidence uh, to even talk about being deaf. Uh, that's something that I really struggled with. And I'm quite conscious that um, many people watching will have different experiences of hearing loss. I, um, My own experience was being diagnosed as being profoundly deaf in my left ear when I was a child, and that was picked up because I was having difficulty learning how to read and write. Uh, my doctors um, believe that it was more than likely that my hearing loss developed in utero. So really it's only something I've only ever known, what it's like to be deaf in my left ear. However, as I've gotten older, in my early 30s, my hearing loss experience has changed because I've got a condition where I'm progressively losing the hearing in my right ear. Uh, that condition is called auto autosclerosis. Uh, so I've had that really unique experience of always knowing one kind of deafness, but having to navigate what it's like to progressively lose my hearing as well. So I've certainly learned that some strategies that I had previously used in my teens and 20s aren't effective anymore in my 30s, um, which is a really interesting conversation to have as well. A checklist where it's the guaranteed journey of if you just do these things, it'll be an easy um, experience to navigate. So my book, uh, The Shape of Sound, really goes into that as well as things that aren't often talked about with hearing loss, uh, such as how to navigate a career friendships and relationships, um, whilst also being deaf, um, how to advocate for your needs, access and inclusion in a way that doesn't jeopardise your job prospects. Um, so that might be something of interest for you to read, but today I'm just going to be really focusing on practical tips and tricks um, about what has helped me navigate going from being utterly ashamed and secretive about being deaf to being able to talk about it with confidence and certainty because I was not born with these skills. I, um, I've i learned a lot along the way. So here's a little bit of an overview. Today's talk is in three parts. Firstly, I'm going to cover off a little bit about deafness, things that even though I was born with hearing loss, I didn't actually know until I started researching for my book. So I wanted to cover that today, just in case you've been experiencing hearing loss and these um, might be things that you haven't quite connected to your hearing loss journey. 
Uh, I'm definitely going to cover asking for access, something, again, I hadn't known about until my late 20s and early 30s. And this is something I am still learning about as my condition fluctuates, um, as well as some tips and tricks, because hearing loss isn't about um, doing it alone. Uh, it's something that friends, families, colleagues need to be aware of in order to um, know how what's the best way to respond. So the first section, thinking beyond your ears. It's a little bit of a pun there, thinking bon beyond your years. Um, and this section I get really, really passionate about because it was like so many puzzle pieces falling into place when I was researching my book and spending a lot of time reflecting on my own journey with hearing health and hearing loss. So deafness isn't just a condition for your ears. It impacts your brain and your entire body. So the first thing I wanted to cover off on is listening fatigue. This is something I didn't realize that I was experiencing on a daily basis. I didn't even know it was a concept until my late 20s. And what it means is that if I'm listening and having to pay an incredible amount of attention to understand information that is cognitively demanding because essentially I'm trying to piece together puzzle pieces of what someone's saying to me. So if I'm in a loud, busy environment and I'm trying to have a conversation with someone, that is going to be infinitely more taxing on my brain than if we were having a one-to-one -one conversation in a, a room where there's no background noise. Just even knowing the concept of listening fatigue completely transformed my understanding of deafness in general, that it is more than just your ears, but it also involves your brain. Now, the other thing that has been instrumental for my understanding of deafness is deaf anxiety. Um, I'll share a quick anecdote of this that might kind of demonstrate how clueless I was about the connections between deafness and mental health. So I was seeing a dermatologist to have a skin check. Uh, unfortunately, skin cancers run in my family. So I was feeling a bit nervous about this initial consultation, um, which I think wasn't surprising for me. I was quite scared what they may say about um, the possibility that I would have skin cancer. So I booked the consultation. I arrived quite early because it was of great importance to me. And I was sitting in the waiting room and it was a beautiful building with these enormous lofted ceilings. And it was quite a um, luxury, luxurious dermatology department where they had uh, aquariums and there was quite a large space with those vaulted ceilings, like I said. And as I was sitting there, I was anxiously looking out for the dermatologist because their rooms were in the back. And as a deaf person, your eyes are so important. I couldn't actually see where the dermatologist would come out from because there were several working there. So already I was in a state of high alert because I wasn't sure when my name was going to be called. And I certainly didn't want to miss my appointment because it, I wanted to make sure I had my skin checked. So I was a little nervously waiting for my name. And when it was called out, um, I went in to have my skin check. And if you've ever had your skin checked, everything is checked. And at the end of the consultation, the dermatologist said, great news. You don't have any suspicious looking marks. Um, it doesn't appear that you have skin cancer. Obviously you need to come back every year, but it looks fine. But have you ever spoken to anyone about your excessive sweating? It's like, 
no, what are you talking about? And the dermatologist proceeded to go through all my treatment options to manage what she believed was an embarrassing condition that I had. I was kind of confused. I knew that I was a bit of a sweaty Betty, but I was a bit blown away. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, I guess I'm a bit sweaty, but um, I don't think I need to be treated. Anyway, 12 months pass and I kind of brushed that off as being quite a funny interaction. I was like, oh, it's so funny that my dermatologist thinks I need to have Botox injections for being a sweaty buddy. I go back for my annual checkup 12 months later in the same setting, those lofted ceilings, the aquariums with all the exotic fish bubbling away in the background. And I'm nervously waiting uh, to hear my name call out, be called out again. My name gets called. I go into the consultation room and I have the consultation again great news. No signs of suspicious marks, no signs of skin cancer. But she brings up my sweating issue again. The difference this time, the penny dropped. I knew at this stage that that waiting room environment was not conducive to a deaf person. There is a lot of um, visual barriers of not being able to see where the clinicians were coming from. I was having to work really hard to listen out for my name because of the acoustic properties being horrendous in there with those lofted ceilings and that background noise of the bubbling aquarium going bop, 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 bop in the background. It was provoking my death anxiety. I was breaking out in the most horrendous sweat because I was so nervous of missing out on getting a skin check. And yes, I was quite nervous anyway because of the family history of skin cancer, but I realized actually this is situational anxiety. Once I realized what the concept of death anxiety was, I started to notice it come up again and again and again. So if I was at uh, a party where there was a lot of background noise, I would notice that my heart would start racing. I would break out into a sweat and I would just be so flustered and hypervigilant and switched on. I started to make the connections more and more between my mental health and my deafness. And that was a really big shift in my understanding of what um, allows me to relax and to hear well. Because unfortunately, the more anxious you are, it actually makes it quite difficult to navigate noisy environments and conversations because your brain is whirring at a million miles a minute. And that perpetuates my listening fatigue. So all these puzzle pieces have just helped me start to go, okay, if I'm in a certain environment, I'm more than likely going to feel death anxiety and I'm going to fatigue more quickly. And if I'm not managing these things, the third thing will happen, mood swings and irritability. So to go back many years, before I knew about listening fatigue and deaf anxiety, I used to think I was incredibly lazy because after school every day, I would feel flat out exhausted. I would come home and throw myself on the couch and just feel like lead. I was so heavy and fatigued. Or I felt really erratic. I would go from being really enthusiastic to suddenly just like, oh, overwhelmed and not wanting to see people. My moods would go up and down, up and down. Now, my friends and family have told me, actually, that's not our memory of it. You always seem pretty even keel. But internally, I felt like I was all over the shop and I just couldn't keep up with people. Again, it's only looking back, I realized, yeah, those are the points when I had tipped past my ability to listen. I had entered the fatigue zone. Now that I'm aware that 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 zone exists, I do my best to avoid tipping into listening fatigue or 
staying in situations where my death anxiety is dialed up because there's nothing you can do when you're in that feeling that is rational. You're a human being reacting in a way that just feels like you're trying to recover and be psychologically safe. Knowing these puzzle pieces has really helped me navigate the world and I feel much more in control and settled in myself. To be fair, I can't always control it, but even knowing these concepts has given me the language to talk to friends and family and to say, actually, I'm experiencing some listening fatigue. I'm going to have to take a five-minute break and I'll get back to you. That was incredibly helpful during the pandemic because not being able to lip read was, it pushed my fatigue to new levels. If anything, I think I still feel burnt out from the pandemic because there was never the opportunity to fully and truly rest. Now, there are physical impacts to deafness as well that I didn't actually realize again until I started writing my book and piecing these puzzle pieces together. There is musculoskeletal pain. I have so many jaw issues from deaf anxiety because I clench so much because I'm concentrating so hard to hear. I also experience a lot of joint stiffness. And I I should flag that I'm a physiotherapist by trade. So musculoskeletal health is my bread and butter, but I didn't even connect these dots for so long. Now, it makes so much sense now that I know. I experience a lot of joint stiffness and neck restriction because I'm constantly preferencing my hearing ear towards voices and towards the direction of sound. So quite often I'm angling my head and twisting it so that my right ear, the one that is only moderately deaf, is able to pick it up. So I'm actually quite stiff on the left side because I'm not, uh, I can even see myself in the, the camera. I'm so stiff on that side. Once I realized that connection, I realized, oh, no wonder I feel just so tightly bound up in my neck, shoulders, and back. I'm so skew if because of that hearing. And thankfully, because I'm a physiotherapist um, by background, I've been able to continually support my body by doing stretches and muscle releases to augment that and offset it. I'm never going to get completely rid of it because it's just perpetual. I'm doing it every day unconsciously of preferencing my hearing ear towards conversation. Now, there are a few tips and tricks I'm going to share soon that um, I've helped alleviate that musculoskeletal pain, but I really just want to impart in this section that deafness is more than just your ears. It impacts your entire body. Now, I'm going to quickly share another quick anecdote to um, illuminate that connection between the cognitive and physical. And this one's a bit hilarious, but as a deaf audience, I'm sure some of you might relate. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, so I have always slept on my right ear. This is something that I utterly loved about being deaf is that I can put my hearing ear onto a pillow and block out the world. I have had the deepest sleep because of that, because essentially I've blocked out all my hearing and I can, I've been able to sleep on trains, on planes, automobiles, wherever, because essentially I can't hear anything. Now, this is a pretty entrenched habit. I just don't fall asleep if I'm sleeping on my left ear. Um, it's like my brain knows the trick to a good sleep always sleep on the one side. I didn't realize this, but it took until my late 20s, early 30s to realize that in instances where I'm sleeping in a new environment, say I'm traveling or in a new hotel, in the middle of the night, I will lift my head off the pillow without consciously realizing it, I will hover my head above the pillow because my brain is unconsciously 
anxious for being in a new unknown environment. And my body is trying to listen and gather information whilst I'm sleeping. So I will literally hover my head above my pillow for God knows how long, just so I'm getting enough information, which blows my mind that I've got one habit of always sleeping on my right side that is so powerful that I know that I won't roll over yet my brain needs enough information that I've developed another habit to compensate its need for information that I literally will hover my head above a pillow. Um, The body and brain is pretty remarkable, but it took me years, years to realize that I have this frustrating habit of listening out for things. And I do it, I'm now that I've noticed this pattern, I do it so much in certain environments where I don't want to miss the alarm if I'm catching a flight or if um, I'm sleeping in a hostel dormitory and I don't know the people around me. Certain There are certain triggers that will initiate this habit. It's really frustrating because I will wake up with the most horrendous headaches and neck pain uh, because it's not very healthy to hold your head and hover it uh, for hours and hours at a stretch. But it's also really taught me about um, my body's need, uh, what it needs to relax and to sleep well. Uh, So in recent years, I've purchased a vibrating alarm Uh, which is a small little alarm that I can slip under my pillow and my brain then knows, don't worry, Fee, you're going to feel the alarm go off in the morning. You can let yourself rest. Um, And so that's a little thing that I'm not sure anyone else experiences, but it really shows you how complex hearing loss is and how hard your body is working to navigate the world whilst being deaf. Now, number three on here is something that I'm sure a lot of you have experienced is headaches. This was a really slow penny drop moment for me where it honestly did not occur to me that headaches and deafness were intertwined. Again, to remind you, it's more than likely I was born being profoundly deaf in my left ear. It is all I have ever known. I've had nothing else to compare it to. And it was only really when I was treating people as a physiotherapist and they would come in and describe their headache symptoms that I realized, holy heck, I can't recall a day without jaw pain or a headache or neck pain. Like it's literally pain is just chronic in my life. And it's not due to an injury. It's really that chronic stress and repetitive movements again and again. And really just knowing that headaches um, exist in my life has been so helpful because I can put strategies in place to try and minimize and avoid headaches uh, where possible. The other one uh, is number four, sensory overwhelm. This is something I didn't realize was a thing again until my late 20s, early 30s, that there are just some environments um, that are just too much noise, too much information, and it does push me into fatigue. But I'd been using strategies for a long time to navigate that without realizing it. So I'll share another story. For my early 20s, um, I used to go out quite a lot to pubs and clubs with my group of friends. Kind of classic usual stuff in your early 20s is to go out quite a bit. I was known as the, the smoke bomb person. I would just disappear. I would just go home. I wouldn't even tell people. I would send a text once I was home and say, hey, tucked up in bed, see ya. I was notorious for it. And I just thought it was just a a habit that I just had where I would just get sick of being out and off I would go. Um, Often on reflection, I realized I had reached the point of sensory overwhelm, that I was no longer capable of 
being in the environment, I would just flee from it. I would do whatever I could to just leave and go home. That is not a sustainable strategy, nor is it a good one for maintaining friends or even letting them know that you're being safe. It gives a lot of confusing messages to people that you just suddenly disappear. Once I had the language of knowing what sensory overwhelm was, it allowed my access journey to improve. So I could articulate to friends and family like, I've reached my limit, I'm heading off now. Whereas previously, I would be so frazzled, so lost for my ability to articulate thoughts in a coherent manner, I would just flee. I would be gone. Having language to advocate has been instrumental in understanding what my needs are, but also it's been really useful to bring friends and family and loved ones into understanding why I'm making certain choices and what will help me navigate the world. All righty. Asking for access. So I've kind of touched on this a little bit. I'm going to be quite conscious of framing it around my own experiences because I don't want to make any assumptions about your journey of hearing health or any health uh, related issues or hearing related issues. It's really complex um, and it fluctuates as well. As I kind of touched on, I've had a quite a steady condition and I've got a condition that is rapidly evolving as well that I'm still learning how to navigate and has associated issues with it in terms of um, balance uh, as well as jaw and neck pain associated with otosclerosis as well. The joys, it's all, it's all a learning journey. So I'm only going to be speaking about the barriers I experience and you might find it useful and relatable, but I'm not suggesting that you feel these same things at all because I respect that we might feel differently. So the first one that I felt for over 20 years was I didn't feel like I was deaf enough to ask for help. I grew up in the era in the 90s where um, sharing the story of Helen Keller was really common. Um, She came up a lot in school, uh, often as an example of inspiration, that she was a deafblind woman who not only learned how to read and write, but she went on to influence policy and change. Uh, She was considered to be a role model. I was not Helen Keller. I uh, was only profoundly deaf in one ear. I was half deaf. I wasn't a real deaf person. I built so many narratives around this that I never brought up my deafness because I had this idea that if I had some hearing, I wasn't worthy of asking for help. I wasn't a real deaf person. I was half hearing. I had to work a bit harder, but did I really need that much help? It honestly was so scrambled in my mind. Only now I look back on it and realize, well, that wasn't great. That is so ableist. I now believe that regardless of your level of hearing, you are deaf. There isn't a bar that you have to jump over in order to be a part of the deaf community. If you want to identify as deaf, beautiful. If you want to identify identify as hard of hearing, amazing. Some people choose the term hearing impaired. I, I personally don't choose that term, but you may identify like that. No judgment, amazing. I think we spend a lot of time um, prioritizing the needs of hearing people, which are people who don't have any hearing health issues. Um, And we often marginalize our needs because of their expectations. Um, But this idea of me not feeling deaf enough really kept me small and it kept me feeling ashamed um, and not feeling like 
I was worthy of asking to be included or asking for help because I wasn't Helen Keller. Another thing that is wrapped up in this, and some of these contradict one another, that's the mind scramble of navigating a disability or deafness. It is such a mind scramble. We do so much work to make the lives of non-disabled people so easy. I had this notion that I didn't want to be a burden. I had this idea that asking uh, to be included was asking for more. Um, I felt like I was putting other people out if I spoke about my deafness um, or asked uh, for access and reasonable adjustments. I had this really ableist idea that it was um, making their lives difficult, which I don't believe that anymore. I got proud through practice. I got proud when I started to hang out with other disabled people. My mind and my perspective completely transformed when I became a member of the disability community. I suddenly realized, um, why am I putting myself down all the time? If access is helping me, more than likely it's helping everyone in the room. Now, this is the one where it gets a little bit tricky because it's a little bit of a contradiction. I was terrified of losing control. If I disclosed my deafness, I knew that it would become harder to get a job or other people will start making assumptions about me and they would decide what's good for me. They will decide how I would get information. And this happens all the time. It still happens where um, people act in a paternalistic way when they discover you have a disability because they're just trying to help. And by just trying to help, they don't actually know how to help. They start making decisions on your behalf of deciding where you should sit or who you should talk to or how you should receive information. Um, that's something I'll talk a little bit more in tips and tricks, but I was terrified of losing control of conversations, job opportunities. Um, I was afraid that I would no longer be invited to social events because other people would start worrying about my fatigue levels or my ability to communicate. It's a lot. Um, that's something I still have to navigate this idea of not needing or wanting to control everything in terms of being included. It's a it's a really tricky one because it kind of almost links into being a burden. Like, no, no, it's all right. I've got it. I can handle this. I know what I'm doing. I can figure this out all by myself. Um it kind of it's this loop that feeds into itself. Now, the fourth barrier that I experienced and I still experience, to be honest, is not being believed. So if I build up that confidence and courage to disclose that I'm deaf and let go of feeling like I need to be in control, let go of that feeling of not being a burden, let go of that feeling of not being deaf enough, and I disclose and tell people, hey, I'm deaf, this is what I need not a lot of people believe me. And I have been told many times that I don't look deaf, that I don't sound deaf. And for a long time, I this really rattled me because I didn't feel like they believed me at the core. And I used to over-explain and thought that if I just gave them my entire medical history, they'll automatically believe that I'm deaf. Unfortunately, that's not the case and it really highlights other people's stigma. That's the the essential bit that I had to learn, that their views of not believing me isn't a reflection on me and my disability and deafness. It's actually highlighting their perceptions and views of the world. So some people have ageist beliefs that only um, older people are deaf. They might not have met someone who is a child or in their teens or 20s or 30s who's deaf. Um, they might not believe that somebody who is deaf can hold a job. 
and be successful and articulate and educated. They might just believe that deaf people um, cannot do any of those things and just stay home all the time. They might believe that a real deaf person wears hearing technology such as hearing aids or a cochlear ear implant. Now, I don't wear any technology at this stage. And that's for a couple of reasons. And I feel pretty comfortable telling this to all of you because it's more than likely you've experienced some of um, the complications of hearing technology. Hearing technology does not cure or fix deafness and it doesn't work for everybody and everyone's conditions. So my profound hearing loss in my left ear could only be modified by a cochlear ear, cochlear implant. That wasn't an option for me in the 90s. And I don't really feel like having that surgery in my 30s because my body and brain is used to not hearing with my left ear. If anything, it would be more traumatic and confusing if I suddenly opened up that pathway in my brain. So I'm not going to go down that um, journey and path of getting a cochlear implant for my left deaf ear. And my right ear that's progressively losing hearing is due to a condition called otosclerosis. And that means the bones in my ear are hardening. It's a completely different condition to my left ear. It's quite ironic that I have it. But it means that the conductive hearing is worsening over time. So a traditional hearing device, hearing aid, isn't going to work. Um and I might have to get a bone-anchored hearing aid at some stage, which is an implant into the skull, which is quite a big decision that I'm delaying at the moment. That's all really complex. And people don't actually care about that information when they're making their assumption. I've fallen into that trap many, many times of trying to educate and explain why I don't wear hearing technology. And I've actually given up on that now because it's quite a burden on me to explain all of that. And essentially the person who's making that assumption doesn't really care about it. They just cannot fathom that a deaf person would have the capability to communicate or they might be really concerned that I didn't actually know about hearing technology and they feel like it's their job to highlight it to me because maybe I haven't heard of hearing aids before. It's again, all about them and what they're trying to satisfy in themselves. It's never a reflection on me. And that's been a really big learning curve for me. I'm still honestly trying to navigate it because it's not a nice feeling of not feeling believed when you disclose but I've gotten a lot better at not trying to fill in their knowledge gaps all the time and trying to assume what their motivations are of when they're um, making assumptions. That was a really long rant. Now, the final one is really important, and this is a beautiful segue into section number three of tips and tricks, is I often didn't bring up my hearing loss and deafness because I didn't actually know what to say for a very long time. I didn't know what reasonable adjustments were. I didn't know what the word accessibility meant, to be honest. And even though I'm a physiotherapist, I had no idea how to navigate a conversation about accessibility. I just had no idea. I had to learn about it. I had to learn what it is I was actually asking people because Asking about access really isn't about telling someone your medical history, not at all. And that took me a really long time to find that out. It's more about advocating for specific needs that you have. And that's the big secret that I want to say today. Tips and tricks for asking for access really comes down to being specific so when I'm asking for access now, I've got a really neat sentence that I tell people. I, I tell people I hear best when there's minimal background noise 
good lighting and I can see the face of the other person speaking. I don't need to explain those three things to people. I'll explain them to you. But I it saves me so much heavy lifting of saying, hey, I rely on lip reading. Can I see your face when you're speaking? I keep it really simple. It's just I need to see the person's face. Good lighting allows me to hear better because I rely on my eyes. So if there's a lot of shadows cast over someone's face or if it's a really dark room and there's a lot of strobe lighting or a um, it's just dark like a cinema or something like that, I'm not going to hear that well at all because I rely, again, on my eyes. Um, and minimal background noise ties into that sensory overwhelm um, and processing of information. It has taken so much practice and repetition for me to get it down to a one-liner, a really quick one line that I remember all the time. I hear best when there is minimal background noise, good lighting, and I can see the face of someone speaking. I can make it more elaborate and give more information if required. It also explains to people that I do have some residual hearing, but I hear best when all these access components are built into it. So it kind of gives them a little bit of guidance, but it certainly doesn't feel like I'm divulging my entire medical history to them. You can also see that the succinctness of it is because I've already understood listening fatigue, death anxiety, sensory overwhelm. I've un understood that deafness is not just in my ears, it impacts my entire body. Now, to be fair, if I will go to an event where I'm speaking or doing a panel, I will still have to work with them to come up with the best access solutions. And I actually prefer that. That gives me that sense of control that I crave. But also I know that they're not going to actually know what suits me best. So because I've opened up the engagement and interaction by flagging my access needs and I haven't told them in extensive detail what it is exactly they then typically ask oh hey Fee so these are your access needs let's set it up what will suit you best where would you like to sit can you see the person's face from there it becomes a conversation more about practicalities and less about emotion and whether you're worthy or not for access. The other thing is often these access um, requirements that I have are free. They do not cost anything. And that's often something that shocks um, venues and organizations and individuals that they assume that access is going to be really expensive but often it is not. Often it's about being prepared and allowing the person with the hearing loss to make some key decisions. Uh, so a few other things about being specific. Captions really help me. I'm really lucky that a lot of uh, online meetings now allow for captions. Whilst they are auto-generated, they're not the best. With a meeting agenda and captions, that helps offset some cognitive fatigue that I have. I also advocate for regular screen breaks, which a lot of meetings that I'm part of on a regular basis, everyone benefits from a quick screen break. And I use that screen break so I'm not listening. Other people use it to stretch, go to the bathroom, get a drink. It literally benefits everyone. I often find it easier to navigate um, situations if I have a general idea of what's going to happen, say if it's an awards ceremony or if it's a meeting, if I have some a broad overview of what it is, uh, some written materials or an agenda, that allows me to pace myself, which is so important because, again, I'm still in control there. I can duck out, go to the bathroom during um, an intermission intermission or step outside just to allow my brain to rest for a few minutes because then I know all right fee you've got to get through 90 minutes have a rest let your brain just not listen for a moment and then back into the room you go the room setup is also really important as well and just flagging to people that you'd like to choose where to sit this is life change it has been 
absolutely life-changing for me of recognizing that where I'm positioned in a room can do so much heavy lifting for me with my hearing loss. So I rarely sit in spaces where I don't have my back against the wall. That helps my deaf anxiety to no end of knowing that I don't have to be hypervigilant, that something or someone is going to come up behind me. So my desk at work, I've got my back against the wall. I'm able to see the room and the door as people come in. That's really great in restaurants as well, where my friends will know that I prefer to have my back against the wall and see into the space. But also knowing the impact of ceiling height, the width of the room and just general acoustic properties, I've gotten so conscious of those things that I now know of when I need to step out and take a break um, or not have back-to-back events in that space. Being specific helps you to navigate it, but it also helps other people help you as well. I have covered quite a bit here. Hopefully um, you found some of it useful Um because we're all on a journey with deafness and hearing loss. Uh, That's something that um, fluctuates minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, because it's your brain trying to navigate and decode sound. So I often tell people I have the best hearing in the morning and then by lunchtime, I'm pretty deaf. I'm pretty, pretty deaf. And that educates them a little bit more that, deafness and hearing loss isn't a steady state. It's a whole body condition and it can be quite exhausting. It'd be really lovely um, if you want to reach out and get in touch. That's one of the great things of having published a book is that uh, so many people have reached out to me um, who have experienced similar things that I have or hadn't put the puzzle pieces together for themselves before reading the book, much like my experience of writing it. It really helped me understand what it's like being deaf, even though I've lived in a deaf body my entire life. Um, So you can pop over to my website, which is www.themurphywriter.com. Or you can pop over to Instagram where I share a lot of tips and tricks about accessibility, and that is at accessible.communications. Or you can follow me on LinkedIn as well, where I often share tips and tricks about accessibility, um, which is a lot of fun. Thanks so much for listening. And that's the other thing. Deaf people and hard of hearing people are the best listeners because we literally listen with our entire body. Thanks so much.